When you go from watching Raw, where it's just a bunch of randomly thrown together crap that really doesn't have any purpose, meaning, or sensibility to it, to then a few days later watching a shorter SmackDown show that especially this week was very heavily focused around advancing stories and driving stories and creating stories. The difference is just night and day. And I really enjoyed SmackDown quite a bit this week. Quite a bit! Of course, SmackDown has one big advantage over Raw or any other wrestling show out there right now. SmackDown has the Tribal Chief. They have the head of the table. They have Roman Reigns. Raw has Drew who is doo-doo number two. You get what I'm saying here. Not hard to see. It all starts at the top and it all trickles down. Like Jey Uso, for example. He was bringing the fire on the mic. He's trash-talking everybody. Why? Because it seems like he might be learning from the tribal chief. That if you don't have supreme confidence in yourself, if you don't believe you can go out there and do those things, you'll never be able to do those things. And you have to let everybody know that you will not tolerate or stand for disrespect. Is, is Jay actually learning? Maybe. I find it interesting now all of a sudden this week Cesaro wants to show up on commentary. Yeah, because Tropicana feels so big it takes a long time to get down there. Sure it does. Can't wait to see where they go with this one with him and Shinsuke. But at least he was bothered enough to show up to be on commentary for this match. And of course when just I think that Jay is actually learning something and he's growing and developing and he's filling out into becoming main event Jay... He falls short again in a match. So no, he didn't learn shit. Just hard-headed Jay continuing to be hard-headed Jay. But solid opening match. And again, there was purpose and story. It follows up on what happened last week when Shinsuke got beat down. Now you're planting the seed of, why wasn't Cesaro there? Like, well done, well done. The Street Profits addressed their losing of the tag team titles last week and... If nothing else, promo okay, but most importantly of all, we didn't have to see who <laughs> fucked Dolph Ziggler. So that makes it a good segment in and of itself. We didn't have to be bothered with seeing him stink up the joint at all on this show. The guys that lost the belts got time on TV. The guys that won the belts didn't, and that's about appropriate. Now typically I would look at a match like Liv Morgan and Italia and... I glance by it. I blow by it in this review. I wouldn't even talk about it at all, depending upon what I wanted to discuss. But here I do want to talk about Billy Kay and my props to her. She was the victim of Vince McMahon's senility of, well, I'm just going to break him up. I don't have a plan for Peyton Royce or Billy Kay. I just want to break him up because I want to fucking do it because I'm Vince McMahon and that's what I do. And we'll figure it out later, but we'll never figure it out later. And now you got Billy Kay kind of floating out there in the ether of WWE abyss. And she's taken what is something really stupid and maximized her television time. Made it worth something. Made herself worth something. And in the process has at least entertained me a little bit. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that instead of going to snow social media and whining, bitching, and snowflaking about what the hell's happened to them, which she technically should have had a right to do if she so chose and so wanted to, she instead took what she was given, has embraced it, and maximized her television time every week. I respect the hell out of that and my props to her because she deserves it. And I hope you guys out there agree as well. And if you do, you should probably smash that subscribe button and leave me a comment and tell, you what you, tell me what you think about what Billy Kay's done to take shit and try to make it shine as much as possible. Rey Mysterio loses to Baron Corbin, and I'm trying to figure out here, are we trying to build towards Dominic and Baron Corbin? Or are we trying to build towards Dominic versus Rey at WrestleMania? And I guess I'll ask you guys, what would you rather see? Would you rather see Dominic maybe take on Baron Corbin at the Royal Rumble or sometime afterwards? Or would you rather see this just be building up towards Rey and Dominic at WrestleMania? Is this the right time to do it? Is this too soon? Is that a match that you want to see? And then the interesting piece at the end, what was Ray talking about when he says, well, Dominic wants to take care of Baron Corbin. He's got somebody in mind that they could talk to. Is that going to be uh, Cain Velasquez? Is that going to be who? 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 Is that Buddy Murphy? Like, where the hell's Buddy Murphy been, by the way? Are him and Aaliyah making babies? 
I'm just, I'm just asking. Oh, God. We got to talk about Bailey's talk segment. Ding dong, hello. Well, ding dong, dumb dicks. That sure sounds an awful lot familiar to something else you might hear on a weekly basis. Hmm? 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 I'm not saying, but I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Um, what was with the Harry Potter <laughs> get up? Ten points, Gryffindor! <laughs> Bailey's got to hurry up so she can go to the pitch and practice her Quidditch and then look down her Hermione's shirt later. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you tell me. Did, did, did Bailey look more like Harry Potter or look like Velma from Scooby-Doo? Jinkies! <laughs> But this segment was, oh God, I mean, I, I admit, to, having, to have Bianca ring the doorbell and go through the door is some um, APA, uh, Acolyte Protection Agency type of stupid, cheeky, corny fun. I enjoy that stuff. Um, but I'm trying to figure out, are they really trying to build towards a match with these two at the Rumble or just maybe them being the final two in the Women's Royal Rumble match? Um, I'm here for it, as long as Bianca goes over. And when I'm watching a segment like this, to me, this is an example of where you see Bianca's natural kind of charisma and star power come through. And I sit there and say, man, if she even got a fraction of the push that some of these other women have gotten, <coughs> Charlotte, <coughs> Becky, um, she would actually be a bigger star. Like, I don't see how that's even, even up for debate. But uh, it, it, these types of segments are good because they kind of show her personality, and kind of easy to connect to. I'm still trying to figure out what the whole sticker deal is with the Alpha Training Academy, uh, why we're so fascinated with hip thrust and pelvic thrust and hip moves with this thing. It's kind of weird. Kind of weird. And Cesaro confronts the Alpha Training Academy backstage, which ultimately led to Daniel Bryan taking on Cesaro. Now, I guess you've got to give the match mark something. And, and you know what? Fundamentally, well, some of you, might say, well, this is boring. I don't want to see these vanilla guys. You know, I'm okay with it. And the reason I'm okay with it, because I've always talked about wrestling needs to have something for everybody. It can't be all midgets and high flyers and spot monkeys. It can't be all super heavyweights. It can't be all of one or all of the other. Like, you got to have some variety and spice here. And there is certainly a place on a show for these types of guys. I am curious, though, you're having Daniel Bryan lose here, like, are you doing this? Is this kind of the traditional, you want to throw people off the scent so you have Daniel Bryan lose a bunch so that way he wins the Royal Rumble and it's a big surprise? Or are you having him lose here and you're not going to have him win the Royal Rumble then you're really not doing anything with Daniel Bryan at all? That's what I'm trying to get here and that's what I'm trying to understand. Oh, look! Sasha's challenged Reginald to a match. Yippee! For those of you that want lame intergender wrestling, here you go. Sasha taking on the smaller Reginald. Yippity skip whoopity woo. Oh, oh. Like, do they do they intend to try and minimize Sasha as much as possible every week? Like that's what I'm trying to figure out here. You cannot look at how they featured Sasha in recent weeks and tell me that that is somebody that this company is truly behind, even though they probably should be. You can't tell me that you look at her and say that they're doing a great bang-up job here. The focus has been more about Carmella. They seem to care way more about Carmella. Which, knowing this company's history, she's blonde. Yep, that's about it. That's about all you need. <sighs> Unbelievable. And Apollo Crews. Yeah. Came out with a new intensity and a new focus this week, apparently. Yeah, that's right. Get mad. Get mad that you lost to Big E. But what I'm trying to figure out is... Where the hell did Biggie's couch come from? How did it get there? Why is he sitting there on a couch watching Apollo Crews and Sami Zayn? Still, my Intercontinental Champion and yours too. Like, where did all that come from? But here's the biggest piece of all. It is a conspiracy. Every week it's a conspiracy. So when Sami Zayn grabs the tights, it's illegal. But when Apollo Crews does it, it's okay. You know what I call that? That's racist. So Sami Zayn, of course, is right. It's an anti-Canadian, anti-Syrian conspiracy out to get him. The man is out to get him. And Apollo Crews, of course, takes advantage of this racist double standard. 
horrible. He grabs his tights. You can't tell Sammy he can't do that and then allow Paul Cruz to do that. Fair is fair and unfair is unfair and that is bullshit. But it is cool to see Apollo Crews and Big E looking kind of aggressive towards each other like, okay, there we go. Get rid of some of the smiling. Let, like, let's get down to brass tacks and let's get nuts here. Which Adam Pierce apparently wanted to do tonight, or last night, excuse me. He wanted to play around and he wanted to play games. So, Roman can play those games too. He's not the head of the table for nothing. He'll whoop your ass and spades and dominoes. It don't matter. Name the game. He'll beat you in all of them. And if you want to slow play contract signings, so be it. And very smart of Apollo Crews early on in the show. Like, you want to get to the top spot. You have to associate yourself with the people that are better than you, the people that are at the top. So, of course, you would naturally want to be backstage with Roman and trying to talk to him. Like, wouldn't you want to associate with this dude right now? Seriously. But Roman, you know, initially... The contract was for a no DQ match between him and Adam Pearce at the Royal Rumble, and he didn't want that. He wants a last man standing match. And he made very clear what his wishes were. You know, and Paul Heyman apparently was going out ham and just doing whatever the hell he wanted to, which, you know, he's going to learn. And frankly, I feel like this whole week, as much as we've been testing Jey Uso over the past couple of months, Roman has, it felt like this week was a big test for Paul Heyman. And our tribal chief wanted to make sure that Paul Heyman knows that he needs to be on his toes too. There is no joy riding here. There is no gravy train when you're working with the head of the table. You must be on your P's and Q's and you must be on point at all times. And Paul Heyman, of course, failed miserably. He had one job to do. That was to abide by Roman's wishes and find them out to begin with before having to sit there and make changes. And then to make sure that the freaking contract was ironclad, locked in tight, no openings, no possibility for loopholes. And of course, Paul Heyman failed because the big revelation from Adam Pierce was that oh, I got my old trick knee, which is, which is good. All right, all right. You want to play that game? All right, scrap daddy, scrap iron, whatever the hell you want to call yourself. I'm going to call you scrap chicken. Black, 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 black. Although I will admit I am disappointed because, frankly, I would have rather seen Adam Pearce versus Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble. But he makes the big revelation that the contracts leave the option uh, for a suitable replacement. The suitable replacement is what everybody pretty much predicted was going to happen, is that this was going to be an avenue to bring in Kevin Owens. And it's going to be Kevin Owens now and Roman Reigns in a last man standing match for the Universal Championship at the Royal Rumble. And you can see the look on Roman's face. And the look wasn't... The, oh my God, it's Kevin Owens. I can't do this a third time. I can't possibly beat him. It was a look of annoyance on a couple of different levels. First, Paul Heyman, I knew this was going to happen. I tested you and you failed. We will deal with you later. And do I really have to beat Homeboy for a third time with this Pillsbury Doughboy looking ass? I've already done it twice. I guess I'll do it again a third time. I mean, that, that, that's that's clearly the look. Like, y'all are going to sit there and say, Roman got played and Roman got out more maneuvered here. All right. All right. Adam Pierce playing freaking checkers and backgammon and whatever the hell. And Roman is playing like world class, world elite caliber type of chess. This all fit into his master plan perfectly. Be careful what you wish for, pudding tits. Because you got it now, Kevin Owens. You got to go on the island of relevancy one more time and take that ass whooping at the Royal Rumble. So, yeah. SmackDown was fun this week. And if you think SmackDown was fun too, make sure you smash that subscribe button, follow the show on Twitter, leave me some comments and let me know what you thought about the show. And if you didn't like SmackDown this week, yo, know, let me know, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to the damn channel. It's not that bad. Just do it, all right? All right, I'm out.